of welcome decorating the streets of Santiago, Chile, attest the popularity of United States Vice President Wallace here on a goodwill tour of South America. At Moneda Palace, the Vice President calls on President Rios. Mr. Wallace's democratic friendliness, his complete understanding of inter-American problems, makes a profound impression upon Chile's chief executive. At the National Stadium, 80,000 people give Mr. Wallace one of the greatest ovations ever accorded a visiting foreign statesman. Beneath pictures of Roosevelt, Rios, and Wallace, the people of Chile salute their good neighbors, proclaim to the world the solidarity of the Americas. American bomber patrol over the Aleutians, one of the many fronts on which United States forces are constantly on guard. In the shadow of the Arctic Circle, in blinding snow and heavy fog, a litter of brand new husky pups relieves the monotony of army life at this remote advance base. Here, less than 1,500 miles from Japan, Men must battle the weather as well as the enemy. An American torpedo assembly line more than half a mile long. Another interesting example of how plants in the United States have converted to war. A year ago, this plant was manufacturing tin cans that packed the nation's food. Now they make tin fish, as United States Navy men call torpedoes, deadliest weapons of the war. At a Pacific Coast shipyard, Mrs. Roosevelt chats with a woman who has helped to build the ship the nation's first lady has come to sponsor. The first aircraft carrier to be launched from the yard of Henry Kaiser. Now geared for mass production, America's miracle shipbuilder promises to deliver six carriers a month. New weapons for the Navy's ever-growing fleet. Somewhere in the wilds of the Canadian Northwest, Engineers building a supply line to Alaska achieve one of the most difficult portage jobs on record. Hauling huge 65-ton steel barges ashore. Loading barges, power boats, and equipment on trailers, the strange river caravan plunges into the wilderness. A 16-mile trip overland to bypass dangerous rapids on one of Canada's mighty rivers. Journey's end? No. The convoy still must travel some 900 miles over inland rivers, lakes, and streams. Here, well past the rapids, they re-enter the waters of the river. A 
supply line of pipe to feed fuel to Alaska and the Northwest. This is but one of the many fronts on which United States and Canadian engineers are working. Pioneers, opening the last frontiers of a vast continent. of New Guinea, Allied scouting planes flash the word. Jap invasion fleet crossing the Bismarck Sea. Reinforcements for Jap garrisons at Leh and Salamawa. From the operations room of the combined Australian and American Air Forces, plans are made to smash the enemy armada. At a dozen Allied aerodromes, flyers spring into action. Fighter pilots and bomber crews hurry to man their ships. Australians, Netherlanders, Americans, taking to the air as one against the common foe. Enemy convoy sighted. Ten warships and 12 troop transports stretched across the waters of the Bismarck Sea. Jap anti-aircraft guns open fire. Now Allied airmen are over the target. Bomb doors swing wide. The bombardiers are on the mark. One after another, Jap transports are left smoking and blazing on the sea. Transports jammed with Jap troops, never to reach shore. salute for the would-be invader and the squadrons return their jobs well done victory rolls signal the news of their success 22 Jap ships 15,000 troops and 102 Jap planes completely wiped out and these are some of the clean-cut young fighters who did the job a yank from San Francisco Australian commander from Adelaide, an American from New York, from South Carolina, from Texas, Australians and Americans, true comrades in arms.